Good evening. In today's class, we want to continue to look at the major themes of the book of Ephesians, particularly in Ephesians 6, where Paul continues to describe the application of the love of God and love of Christ in practical everyday situations, including relationships one with another. In chapter 6, he begins to describe family relationships between parents and children. And interestingly, he doesn't begin with parents' top-down authority, but rather with children taking responsibility for their relationships with their parents. He begins in chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents. It's the right thing to do. And the first commandment with a promise that blessing will come is the commandment in the Ten Commandments to honour your father and your mother, to honour one another, but particularly our parents who've invested so much into us. Listen carefully, caringly, lovingly to your parents. Honour them. Verse 3, so that it may go well with you and you'll enjoy a long life. That is, there's much that our parents can teach us that we can learn from them that'll help us to live well. And many children may feel like going to war with their siblings or going to war with their parents, but this can lead them to miss out on the wisdom that parents can show to them and reveal to them and help them along the way. Paul then moves on to the parents themselves and says in verse 4, Fathers, be careful not to exasperate your children. Rather, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That is, fathers, you can learn from God, you can learn from his word, you can learn from the wisdom of life, and you can apply this caring, loving revelation of God to raising children, and things will go well, particularly if you follow the training and instruction that God has given you. And then in verse 5, Paul moves on to the relationship between bosses and workers or between those who are rulers and those who are servants. And in chapter 6, verse 5, Paul begins with the servants. Obey your masters, respect and fear them with sincere hearts, just as you would obey Christ. Notice the emphasis on sincerity and authenticity and being real and genuine, just as a person might show that authenticity and genuineness in the church or in their obedience to Christ. It's important that they show it as they relate to one another. Verse 6, Paul moves on to obedience, not only to win favour, which can be external obedience when a person's eye is upon us, but rather as servants who seek to do the right thing at all times with a genuine heart for the things of God. Notice the emphasis on the heart and on the core of one's being, which may be different to what we think of when we talk about a romantic heart today. Rather, this is the core of one's being, the core of one's ideals and values, um, and having a genuine appreciation for the will of God and outworking it. In verse 7, Paul says we should wholeheartedly, with all our being, serve the Lord and outwork that service in our loving care for one another. Verse 8, you know the Lord will reward each of you when you do good, whether you be a servant or a free person. And this reward can come through simply the natural rewards of when you do right, then good things unfold. And it can also come from that which goes beyond the natural when God sees that which we're doing and God rewards us for doing the right thing and showing love and care for one another, just as parents reward their children. Verse 9, the masters, the rulers, have a particularly heavy responsibility in that they should treat their those who serve and work for them in a loving, caring way. They shouldn't threaten them. They uh, shouldn't um, abuse their power towards them or over them. They should need to recognise that they too have a master and a ruler in God, in heaven, in Christ, and that God 
doesn't show favoritism one to another, but God cares for all his people, just as parents care for all of their children. And this is one of the great dangers in any working relationship is that it's very tempting to favor one group of people or one sort of people or those like us over others. Whereas we're reminded here that just as God treats all people, even handedly without favoritism, we too should do the same. And then we move on to a very famous passage in Ephesians 6, the passage about the armor of God. And notice that this passage on the armor of God continues on this theme of practical application in relationships. That is, the armor of God can help us in relationships. At the same time, the armor of God can be seen as drawing together the major themes in the book of Ephesians. That is, there are battles that we face, and if we wear this armor, then we're able to push through in these battles, um, protected and safe, so that we can uh, move forward with assurance in that which we do. We're told in verse 12 that our struggle is not against other people, flesh and blood, but rather against those who control rulership or authority or power um, in the dark world around. That is, uh, we can think more deeply about who has the authority over the ideas and the ideals and the beliefs and all that we understand to be real and true. Partly, it comes through um, rulers here on earth, politicians, uh, it comes through academics, it comes through the media, it comes through the seven mountains, which include those who are rulers in families, rulers in culture, rulers in politics and economics and law. The Rome was surrounded by seven mountains, and today this is often applied to the mountains of culture that is around us. Those who rule the city and rule our country and rule our world are those who rule in the areas of politics and education and church and faith and also in media and in legal circles. There are many who rule in various spheres, but we know that God and Jesus are seeking to rule over all and that as we put our faith in God and Jesus and connect with them, then we can know a healthy relationship with those who rule. But there's always a danger that in life, People can rise up and attack us. And that's why we're reminded that just as soldiers would wear protective clothing and soldiers today wear protective clothing, so too when we put on the protective clothing provided by God and not just whipped up by ourselves, then we are safe. And Paul lists the elements of the protective clothing provided by God Firstly, as beginning with the belt of truth buckled about the waist. That is one of the first items of the armor that would be put on would be the belt, which would be much larger. It'd be like a carpenter's tool belt. It would have uh, various compartments on it, like a, a police uh, belt that would have compartments for the things that would carry. It's this belt that holds the rest of the uniform together. And Paul says, truth is that core central starting point that governs our relationship one with another and with truth in culture and what is right and true about the world we live in. The first goal in living well in this world in which we live is the goal of adhering primarily to truth. Secondly, we are told that just as the soldier would put on the breastplate to protect at the core of his being, righteousness and rightness is uh, important for us. And this is a righteousness and rightness, not that we provide ourselves a self-creation, because that then becomes very artificial and synthetic and unreal, but rather the righteousness that's provided by God that is truly real and truly true and provided by God through Christ. And then verse 15, 
What should be our goal in putting on this armor? Where are we heading? That is, it should be peace. Our goal in putting on our shoes, being ready to go forward, should be the good news, the gospel that brings peace. Verse 16, we are told that just as a soldier needs a shield to protect them and hold up at all times, we are protected by faith, not by faith in faith, but and not by faith of our own construction, but rather faith in God, in his word, in his revelation, in his truth. And so faith is a shield that protects us from the attacks that might come against us. And we're told that this faith can extinguish arrows that might come against us. And so if in relationships people may say things that might unsettle us, if we have faith and confidence in God and in truth and in love, then we are not going to be shaken and we'll be able to move forward with confidence, just as the soldiers in these times were able to move forward with confidence. And verse 17 um, the head particularly needs to be protected, and this is analogous to salvation. That is, our mind and our very being is protected by the knowledge that we have been saved by God through Christ and that we can participate in that salvation. And finally, what about the ways in which we deal with the attacks that come? Um, we're reminded that just as a soldier has a sword, we have the word of God that we're able to speak hope and love and goodness into situations, and we're able to see that through the word of God, then healthy relationships can occur. And so this passage on the armor of God can apply to the discussion of relationships, and it can also apply to the discussion in the whole of Ephesians on the attacks that can come against us. And through Christ, we are able to be transformed and have victory. And we're able to move forward in victory just as a soldier can move forward with the armor that's been provided by them rather than simply, simply constructed by the soldier themselves. Verse 18, we're reminded that we should be ready to pray at all times, ready to request from God and ready to praise God at all times and ready to pray for all God's uh, people um, so that people like the Apostle Paul, who've been given a message to communicate, who are bringing victory around the world, will be able to do the, that which they have been called to do as ambassadors, even if at times they can be like Paul, ambassadors in chains, ambassadors under attack, so that they can stand fearlessly and see the victory of God um, overcoming the enemy around. And so the book of Ephesians concludes with chapter six as a reminder that as we put on the armor of God, as we put on truth and righteousness provided by God, pursuit of peace and salvation and faith, that we can know and participate in the victory that has been provided for us through God in Christ and by the Spirit. Let's pray as we draw together in these moments the final chapter of Ephesians. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation in this chapter that you have given us all that we need in Christ Jesus. You've given us an armor that can defeat the enemy. You've given us a shield of faith. You have given us a belt of truth and righteousness. You've given us a helmet of salvation and feet shod with the gospel of peace. Lead us now in the victory and the hope that you have called us towards so that we might be able to share in the victory that you have provided for us through Christ. Amen. So let's take a few moments now to go around and share each one. What stands out to you in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 that draws together some of the major themes? What stands out to you that can be applied from this book? Thank you.